evening, everyone, and welcome to a very special living room lecture with Alex Filipenko. I am delighted that Alex was willing to have this special conversation with us. I know so many of you have heard about his science over the years and the incredible work that he's done at both Berkeley and at Lick Observatory. Um, but I don't know that many of us have had the opportunity to really talk to him about his teaching. And after all, we know that uh, he's an incredible teacher. Um, as, as our email introduction shared with you, uh, he has over 800 students in his Berkeley class each year. And time after time, uh, the Berkeley student body names him as the best professor on campus. Tonight, we're gonna talk to him more about how he first um, decided to become a teacher, what that means to him, and why he continues uh, to really focus on undergraduate and graduate education when he could work with any scientist in the entire world. Thank you so much, Alex, um, for joining us this evening. Well, thank Before you, we... Natasha and Marianne, for, for hosting this. Absolutely. Before we get started, I just wanted to take time to recognize that uh, another incredible observatory was saved uh, this last week, Mount Wilson. And we wanted to, to, to take time to, to express our gratitude to not only the state of California, but the firefighters that came from other states to save that historic observatory. Um, Gosh, what a couple of months that we've had here, Alex. Just incredible. I mean, you know, you mentioned Mount Wilson and part of my doctoral thesis at Caltech was done using the 100 inch Hooker telescope at Mount Wilson. Um, so Mount Wilson is very dear to my heart as is Lick Observatory, as is Keck, of course. But in my opinion, Mount Wilson Observatory is the single most important ground-based observatory in the history of astronomy. So although they don't do that much science there anymore, there is an interferometer, but the 100 inch and 60 inch telescopes are used more for public outreach. It's a historically enormously valuable site and dear to my heart. So I'm really glad that it was saved and Lick was saved and my fingers are crossed that new fires don't approach either of those observatories or Palomar where I did much of my graduate work as well. Absolutely. Well, let's pivot a little bit, Alex. Um, I'm going to start with, you know, uh, maybe the easiest question, maybe the hardest. <laughs> um, did you always know that you wanted to teach? Oh, um, yeah, I think so. You know, my father was a mathematics professor, so that sort of rubbed off on me, you know, teaching and conveying what we know. And the other thing is, I wanted to become a scientist from a very young age. I mean, it was, it was in my blood. I played with magnets in the sandbox and just loved science, what, loved watching bugs, chemistry sets, things like that. And, you know, most scientists are at universities and they also teach. And so those two go hand in hand. And for me, learning and helping others learn seemed like such a joy. I, you know, always liked talking about science and explaining things to people. So yeah, I think becoming a teacher was sort of in the cards. What was the first class you ever taught? Well, you know, it was um, as an undergraduate, I was at UC Santa Barbara as an undergraduate in this little college <laughs> called the College of Creative Studies, which is sort of a, a weird name. It sounds like you just sit around contemplating your navel and, uh, <laughs> and, and basket weaving and stuff, but, but it's for, you know, college students who are extremely self-motivated or and already know quite a bit about their chosen field. And so they're allowed to pursue things a um, little bit more independently than a typical college student. So in my freshman year, I took a seminar in that college from Professor Stan Peel. And it was on general astronomy from George A. Bell's amazing book. I think it was called Exploration of the Universe. And Peel and that book really turned me on to astronomy. And so then two years later, as I progressed as a physics major, Stan Peel gave me the opportunity to teach that same class, a small seminar to just a handful of very motivated, inquisitive students. Uh, and I taught it from the same book. So that was as a junior in college. And then again, I taught it as a senior in college. So 
I wasn't just a teaching assistant, I was the instructor in charge. So those two years of teaching it um, in my junior and senior years were a very formative experience and they cemented this joy I had of conveying knowledge to others and especially just talking about science and especially astronomy. So those were my, those were my first classes as an undergraduate. What an incredible opportunity at such a young age. Yeah, it was really great. And, you know, I owe it to the College of Creative Studies and to Stan Peel at UC Santa Barbara. I don't think I would have had that opportunity at a giant college um, where there wasn't so much of a focus on individual students who are very self-motivated. And, and um, yeah, I was really lucky. Um, talk to us about some of the subsequent classes that you taught in those early years. What were they like? Did you follow that same model or were they very different once you got into your grad program and professional yeah. career? You know, it, it's interesting because though I love teaching um, and I had started giving public talks occasionally at around that time in grad school, I had a Hertz <laughs> Foundation Fellowship, which allowed me 100% time to do my research. And so in fact, I was not a teaching assistant during any of my years as a grad student at Caltech. And then I became a postdoc at Berkeley in 1984, and I might have taught a grad seminar on active galaxies, you know, these central regions of galaxies that have a giant black hole that's sucking in material. That would have been sometime in the interval around 85 or 86, but I'm not sure I taught a course at that time. It might have been when Berkeley hired me on their faculty in 1986 that I taught my first uh, course since undergrad. I'd have to look back up what I did during my postdoc days. Um, so anyway, quite a few years went by between those undergrad years and becoming a professor and really teaching my first classes. But the first class I think was a, a freshman sophomore seminar on the nature of life in the universe. And then I definitely taught a graduate seminar on active galaxies. And then in fall of 87, I think was the first time I taught my, by now very big, but even back then reasonably big 300 student course on introductory astronomy. And that was a, a real blast. I really enjoyed it in the fall of 87. And I've taught it once per year for 34 years. Now, actually this is the 35th or 34th year, whatever it is that I'm teaching it um, right now, in fact, using Zoom remote learning and remote teaching. So that in fact is my favorite class, but I've also taught you know, graduate seminars on exploding stars, active galaxies, a junior senior level course on stellar structure and evolution, a sophomore seminar on the nature of space and time. I taught that last spring when in the middle of the semester, suddenly we were under shelter in place. And so I had to change my whole teaching style. But my favorite course really is the, is the introductory course, I would say. You said it's been about 35, 36 years or so. And yeah. besides COVID, um, what, if anything, has really changed about your teaching and your approach to teaching over these years? Yeah, um, I would say, and this is more specifically for the general ed course for hundreds and hundreds of students, I've learned not to teach the boring technical details that are useful mostly to astronomers, but that you know the generally educated person doesn't need to know about. And an example is, is magnitudes, magnitudes of stars. You know, it's sort of an archaic system. Once you get used to it, it's actually quite convenient. I personally like magnitudes, but it's not very fundamental. More, you know, more fundamental is that the apparent brightness of a star is equal to its power, its luminosity, how intrinsically much oomph it has, divided by four pi and the distance squared because the light you know, spreads out over a sphere. And so that's the more fundamental concept, the inverse square law. Who cares about magnitudes, okay? And especially now, there's so many more fundamental and exciting things to teach. I mean, the past three decades, Natasha, as you know, have been a golden age in astronomy with so many incredible discoveries. So I have to omit progressively more of the mundane stuff in order to leave time for the exciting things, you know, dark energy, exoplanets, 
black holes, all this, you know, dark matter, all this cool stuff. Most of the things, in fact, all of the things I just mentioned were either not existent or not very much talked about in the mid to late 1980s when I started teaching. Um, you know, exoplanets were uh, conceptually discussed. I mean, why should our solar system be the only one? But not a single exoplanet had been found. And dark matter was certainly discussed because of what Vera Rubin did and Fritz Zwicky and others. But it just wasn't a mainstream field because there wasn't that much evidence for it. But all these subjects, you know, dark energy definitely didn't exist in the accelerating universe. You know, so all these things now exist. I mean, gravitational waves, the image of the silhouette or the shadow of the black hole in the galaxy M87, right? Astronomy is just so much more exciting now. Um, there's so much science to do. Yeah. You mentioned, and so much has changed. You know, a lot of faculty members, including science faculty prefer to focus on the research instead yeah. of teaching. Um, how do you carve out time to do both and why? Well, you know, <laughs> there are 24 hours in a day and you're supposed to sleep for eight of those, right? So it's definitely, you know, and I've got a family and friends and stuff. So it, it's a struggle to find enough time for everything. There, there's no doubt about it. You know, academia, there, there are many, there are many really wonderful things. I'm largely my own boss and all that, but, uh, but it's, it's hard to fit everything in. Um, in my opinion, good research and good teaching really do go hand in hand. So by having inquisitive students all around me and by attempting to explain things to them, my own thoughts actually become clarified. And, and in fact, I sometimes have new ideas. So, you know, with students around always asking questions, that keeps me on, on my toes and mentally stimulated. You know, it's a good thing. And, you know, if the research isn't going well, which sometimes it isn't, you know, you still have the teaching to keep yourself active and satisfied. And in fact, the late celebrated physicist Richard Feynman at Caltech, who in fact was one of my instructors, and I learned a lot from him, he felt the same way. He felt that having students around stimulates ideas. And in fact, it's something you can do when the research isn't doing well. So in fact, he had been made an offer by the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study, which is, you know, one of the top places in the world for just sitting around and doing your research. But he uh, declined that offer in favor of a professorship at Caltech, in part for those two reasons, and I feel similarly. You've received a lot of awards for your teaching that, yeah. that we outlined before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, which one was the most meaningful to you, Alex? Yeah, you know, I mean, you, you teach for the personal satisfaction of conveying knowledge and all that and, and interacting with students. But, but of course, the, the recognition is nice and, and, uh, and appreciated. So probably, you know, well, undoubtedly, the Case Carnegie National Professor of the Year in 2006 was the most prestigious and unexpected. I mean, you know, the competition must be immense. National Professor of the Year among doctoral and, and research institutions. I, I was blown away. But, you know, in another sense, the, the voting by the Berkeley students of best professor on campus, whatever it is, nine times, was, was more rewarding just because that comes from the students. However, let me, you know, full disclosure here. Uh, Getting that recognition from the students is very dependent on teaching a gigantic class because it's basically a popularity contest. And I will be the first to admit that I know of many professors on the Berkeley campus who are equally good or perhaps even better in, in some you know, metrics, all right? But they will never get that award because they don't teach a giant class of 800 students, okay? They might have a 95% favorability rating, but they, if they only teach, you know, 40 students, then I with a 60 or 70% or whatever it is favorability rating and 800 students will get more votes. So I've been unfairly privileged by how that vote is done. I have benefited from it in an unfair way. However, now because computer science and data science are these rapidly emerging majors, I mean, they went from zero students five or six years ago to being among the biggest majors, if not the biggest major on campus. 
they have gigantic classes. There's one computer science class that's more than twice as big as mine. And the professor is very good, okay? And so no matter how we are in relative terms, uh, that professor might be a little bit worse, but by having more students, they're gonna get more votes. And so I predict I will never again win this award. Someone else will unfairly benefit from how it is administered, okay? <laughs> Very modest of you, Alex. We well, all know no, what a good it's, teacher it's, you are. It's true. It's true. <laughs> I, I'm a I'm an okay teacher, but I know lots of other really good teachers too. Okay. Absolutely. Well, so many of us know what a great teacher you are because you've given so many public lectures and done so much public outreach. You've done TV documentaries. What is it about those activities uh, that you particularly enjoy, and and how do they differ from being in a classroom? Yeah, you know, they provide more opportunities to bring the wonders of science and especially astronomy to the general public, um, many of whose members might not ordinarily be interested in science. So the public talks, the documentaries, things like that, of course, some of them are aimed toward the enthusiasts, just as my courses are. But just as my general ed course is you know, sort of a breadth requirement. I mean, the students have to take some sort of a quantitative reasoning, physical science requirement. You know, most of the students are not already intrinsically interested in science. And so it's a challenge and a goal of mine to get them interested. So the public talks and documentaries are an extension of that. I mean, I really enjoy it. Uh, it's something that people tell me I'm good at. And you know, it also, again, gives me a chance to really see if I understand a concept. And again, going back to Feynman, he used to say, I think, that if you can't explain something in relatively simple terms, it probably means you don't fully understand it yourself. And sometimes halfway through an explanation, especially during the Q&A session, I'll realize that I don't fully know what I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> so then I'll go and I'll try to learn it better myself. And I might not have questioned my knowledge had I not given that public talk and had someone ask me a question about the, the material, you know. Um, Ted Swift asked a related question in the chat. He said, do you have any suggestions for improving the academic amateur collaborations, those folks who are out in the public. Oh, um, yeah. He's had, you know, you know, some frustrating time approaching right. academics. So, I mean, the, the field of astronomy, more so than any other science, I believe, certainly more so than experimental high energy physics, welcomes and allows the pro-am collaboration. Um, you know, you can't be a high energy experimental particle physicist and, and compete with a Large Hadron Collider or the Stanford Linear Accelerator or something like that. But amateur astronomers have been and continue to make important contributions to astronomy. You know, they found exploding stars in my own field and I've collaborated with amateurs. They can look at the Kepler satellite data and find exoplanets and find weird stars that undergo dips like Tabby's star that the fancy Fourier-based programs didn't notice because the signal isn't all that periodic, you know. Um, they can look for transits now, especially using little telescopes like this wonderful new device by a company called Unistellar. It's a, a, a telescope called the EV scope and it allows you to take images with, which are really, really great. Anyway, you know, you can do lots and lots of really cool stuff now as an amateur astronomer with equipment that's relatively inexpensive. And it's because the detectors, these electronic detectors are now so good and inexpensive and the computers used to analyze the data are so good and inexpensive. I mean, both areas have benefited immensely from Moore's law. So we, we welcome our collaboration with serious amateur astronomers. You've talked to us a little bit about why you like to surround yourself with students. I've met uh, students as young as first year on your team. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, your current team and, and what they get to do as a yeah. member? Sure, right. You know, um, as you said, the current team has even some beginning students, first year undergrads. And in some cases, I've even had high school students. And you know, that helps me educate and inspire the next generation of students and give them opportunities to get involved in real research the way I did as an undergraduate. You know, and this sort of early exposure to research can make a huge difference in their careers, in the careers of aspiring young scientists. 
Uh, I have about 12 undergrads in my group right now, beginning with freshmen all the way up to seniors. And we start them off by looking at exploding star candidates, supernova candidates that my Katzman Automatic Imaging Telescope, Kate, at Lick Observatory finds. And we're also now helping with the Zwicky Transient Facility down at Palomar Observatory, you know, which scans a much bigger fraction of the sky, honestly, than Kate can. So, so anyway, there are all these candidates that the software picks up, but the human brain eye combination is still better in the final straw sort of at discriminating what might be a true genuine exploding star and might, might be some sort of a, a thing masquerading as an exploding star. So they can get their hands dirty doing that kind of relatively simple data analysis. Then they learn how to run the one meter nickel telescope at Lick Observatory. By the way, I have Lick Observatory here on my t-shirt and I'm glad it didn't burn down. Anyway, uh, they learn how to operate the nickel telescope and they can do so remotely from an observing room on the Berkeley campus. And all of the University of California uh, campuses have these remote observing rooms. And now with COVID-19, we can even observe from home. We call it you know, pajama observing. But this gives them real hands-on experience with data taking and analysis. Whereas in the past, I could just sort of hand a tape or cards, I go way back, okay, to a student and say, here's a bunch of data, uh, analyze those data. Now they can be involved in the data taking. And then as the students mature, they can help with projects that others are leading, grad students or postdocs. And then some of my undergrads have even been the leaders and ultimately the first authors on research papers uh, that they have led. The grad students, of course, are pursuing a PhD thesis or maybe one or two projects before they decide to move to a different group. We encourage them to try their hand at different types of research. But you know, PhD research is, of course, uh, a much more intense multi-year commitment where they have to do really something new and, and, um, and, and um, innovative. Yeah, I mean, it, it can't be just something someone else has done, you know. And then the postdocs come in with considerable experience and often they are reasonably you know, independent and I hire postdocs who are doing science of mutual interest, um, but I typically don't have as much guidance for them as I do for the grad students and the undergrads. And you know, I'm proud to say that you know, my postdocs have done very well as have the grad students. One of my postdocs, Adam Reese, now has a Nobel prize because um, when I was a member of two teams that was studying the expansion history of the universe, Adam Reese was a postdoc, a Miller fellow on, on the team led by Brian Schmidt. And I was Adam's immediate mentor at Berkeley. And Adam was the first person on Schmidt's team to realize what the data were telling us, that the universe is actually ex expanding faster with time rather than more and more slowly. And, and of course, it's, uh, it, it was really, um, immensely rewarding to be his mentor and to see the success that the teams um, had in this, in this science project. So it was very gratifying. Um, when I've talked to your team, Alex, a lot of them were doing um, complementary but different research. For example, they would look at the same problem from different ways without telling each other what their results were so that they could see if they were getting to the same place. Can you talk to us about a couple individuals and how um, their research complements each other and helps us gain a larger understanding of, of yeah. the universe? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, you know, in science, you have to approach subjects, particular topics from, from different angles, you know, and, and often a discovery, of course, is not really verified until it's verified not only using the same techniques, but more importantly, using other techniques. And certainly that was the case for the accelerating expansion of the universe. So on my team, I often have people working on complementary aspects of a particular problem, so as to improve our overall understanding of what's going on. So in the case of the type 1a supernovae that we use to discover the accelerating expansion of the universe, I might have one student looking at the brightness versus time, the so-called light curve, of the supernova. And the light curves tells us something about the physics of what's going on. And also there are certain supernovae that aren't as useful and as others are. 
So that's one way to approach the problem, but you also want to obtain their spectra, right? You want to pass the light through a prism and look at the different brightnesses as a function of wavelength. And that can often offer clues as to whether the type 1a explosion is a normal one or an abnormal one masquerading as a normal one. And, you know, the latter could actually mess up your results, right? If you're drawing conclusions from an abnormal one that you're assuming to be a normal one. And then another flip side is that if you use the technique of spectropolarimetry, where you can actually measure whether an object is symmetric or asymmetric by looking at polarized light, sort of like the light bouncing off of water or concrete, you know, the polarizing glasses, sunglasses work by only allowing the minor component of the reflected light through um, because the light gets polarized after bouncing off. I mean, it's an asymmetric situation. So by looking at spectropolarimetry, you can look for asymmetries in these type 1As. And if you find that they're asymmetric in their explosions, well, then that would be something that contributes potentially to their apparent brightness, right? It's not just how luminous they really are and how far away they are, but it could be that it depends on the angle, the line of sight from which you're observing them. So that's an example of how different techniques can be used to improve our understanding of a technique and our confidence in using a technique to come to what was really a, a pretty fabulous conclusion. I've been lucky enough to meet some of these incredible young people. Some a lot of folks. Now, uh, one of them, Ryan Foley, is a faculty member at Santa Cruz. Absolutely. So. <laughs> um, these folks um, who, who are listening in, they haven't had that opportunity necessarily. Can you talk to us about one or two of the folks, on, if, if they were meeting your team, what's one or two of the folks that they might be meeting? Where do they come from? Do they also have parents who, who were educators? What got them interested, involved? Did, are they Sorry, first generation? I, yeah. I didn't who catch the first part of your question. I didn't catch the sense of it. Yeah, who, if, if, if we were all get, if your students were here today, yeah. what are the types of student, who are they? Name a couple of them and tell us more about them. Oh, well, yeah. So, you know, I, I just mentioned Ryan Foley, who's a professor at Santa Cruz and is interested in stellar explosions and also gravitational waves and merging neutron stars and things like that. Also in improving this supernova cosmology that we do. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm really proud of what he has achieved and his team was the first uh, among about six or seven in quick succession, admittedly, but nevertheless, the first to find the optical counterpart of the first merging neutron stars that were detected by the LIGO-Virgo collaboration in August of 2017, four days before a total solar eclipse. So, and you know, and that was using a telescope much like the ones we run at Lick Observatory where they're either robotic or semi-robotic or whatever. And you kind of look at the images and, and see what's new, you know, um, and that was, that object was in the Southern hemisphere and pretty far West. So it was actually hard to look at with the telescopes from Lick. It wasn't available for a very long time, but from Chile, it was, it was more available. Um, another, you know, former student is Ryan Shornock, who is now, I believe, at Northwestern University, and he too is, is, is interested in these exploding stars, and especially the weird ones. In fact, at my birthday party celebration a couple of years ago, he gave a talk called Alex and the Weirdos, because I kind of like extreme supernovae, because they can teach us something about more or less normal ones that have some weirdnesses that might not be so apparent, okay? So if you study extreme cases, you learn more about the general phenomenon. Uh, my first PhD uh, to have finished under my direction was Joe Shields, who's at Ohio University, and he's interested in active galaxies and the supermassive black hole in the center. He also is very good at and is interested in administrative work. So I've joked with him that, you know, he not only passed me up in becoming department chair, because, but, but he also became dean of physical sciences at Ohio University. And you won't catch me being dean of anything. I mean, for most of my career, I've even escaped being department chair, okay? But he likes that kind of thing. And we need people who like and are good at those kinds of things. 
Going back to the UC system, Aaron Barth at UC Irvine is a professor. He works on active galaxies. And in particular, when the supermassive black hole is swallowing material uh, that's in an accretion disk, sometimes that disk has a lot of material falling into the black hole, sometimes not as much. And so there are variations in how bright the active nucleus is in the middle, because when there's more material falling in, it's more bright. It's not that light is coming from within the black hole, it's coming from the vicinity of the black hole. <laughs> well, when you have light coming out from this hot accretion disk, it ionizes clouds of gas around the, um, the galactic nucleus. And that they then respond by you know, having ionized hydrogen and other elements and then recombining and producing emission lines as the electron cascades down to lower levels. And the strengths and even shapes of those emission lines can change with time. And if you measure then the continuum variations and the emission line variations through a technique known as reverberation mapping, you can learn not only about the mass of the black hole, but about this region around it where there are all these clouds of gas. And Aaron Barth has led the LAMP program, the Lick AGN monitoring program, where at Lick Observatory, one of the great strengths is that we have frequent access over and over and over again to small, medium, or modest sized telescopes going up to the Lick three meter on, in that biggest dome there, or the, I mean, equally tied to the 36 inch refractor because, you know, nowadays we can build bigger telescopes in smaller domes. But anyway, we have lots and lots of access to time at Lick. And so we can conduct projects that simply can't done, can't be done with something like the Hubble te Space Telescope or the Keck telescopes, both of which I love, all three of which, you know, two Keck telescopes in the Hubble. I'm a Hubble hugger, I'm a Keck hugger. I had a Keck night on Thursday, but they're few and far between. So I do projects that don't require repetitive access to the telescope. Whereas at Lick, we can do this kind of science. And so Aaron does, has done that kind of science. So those, those are a few of my many, many students and postdocs. Do they all go on to be astronomers, Alex? Well, you know, so most of my grad students and postdocs did become professional astronomers. But in recent years, the tide has been turning. There are fewer job opportunities in academia, or at least that's the perception. And maybe with COVID-19, you know, the whole concept of universities is, you know, changing, perhaps, perhaps permanently. It's, it's not entirely clear what's going to happen. At least it's not clear to me or they don't see themselves at a university long term. You know, it's, it's a great job, but as I said, it's not for everyone. You know, I don't go home at five o'clock and stop work thinking about my job. I mean, I'm sort of thinking about it all the time in part because I love it, all right? But that's not for everyone. And they can make more money typically um, in industry. I mean, I live a comfortable life, but you know, I'm not some CEO of, of some giant um, company or anything like that. I'm not, you know, a, a lawyer or anything, you know. So, um, you know, there are higher paying jobs in, in industry, especially with good computer science. And many of them get the kind of training that industry and actually Wall Street really likes. You know, the quants like people who can do problem solving and computer programming and aren't afraid of gigantic matrices and linear algebra and things like that. So, you know, we've had a number of students and postdocs who go on to Wall Street because the quants like them. Or they go to Google or Microsoft and Apple, and you know they're they're super highly trained in problem solving, and um, you know computer science and big data nowadays. So many of them are going on into those fields, and we're not discouraging that. Um, we're in fact encouraging it. And when I was a grad student, I got the distinct impression that my advisor and the other professors at Caltech would have felt that I was a failure and they were failures if I did not become clones mm -hmm. of them and get a professorship at one of the top universities. I definitely got that impression. And we're not having that attitude now. There are many ways in which astronomers are trained that they can actually become, uh, you know, sort of, uh, they can become more influential and they can do more good to society as a whole than just becoming yet another professor doing research. 
and especially for our undergrads of whom there are many, many, and many, you know, right? I mean, many of them are interested in astronomy, but they have no intention of becoming professors of astrophysics. So many more of them go into other fields. And I think that's happening to them uh, to a greater degree as well. But you asked about all of my previous <laughs> students, undergrad, grad, and postdocs. I would say the most postdocs became professors followed by grad students, followed by undergrads. And, and that's to be expected because you know, there are fewer postdocs, more grad students, more undergrads. And, and at the earlier age, they're not yet certain about what it is they want to do with their lives. Okay. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you can pursue lots of really interesting careers with a degree in astrophysics. Yes, absolutely. Um, Alex, uh, we know that you have taught thousands and thousands of folks. Um, you don't need to name names, but tell us about a student who taught you a lot. Oh gosh, you know, there, there have been so many, um, and, you know, and collectively I've learned from all of them. But if I had to pick out one, I'm thinking back to a graduate student of mine who was quadriplegic. He had a, an accident when he was a senior in high school. And in fact, the doctors told his parents that they should just cut him off, right? That he's not gonna live, but, but he did live. His parents didn't cut him off and he has a good brain and and a, a lot of um, a, a lot of just gut sort of feeling that I'm going to continue despite all odds against me, right? That that kind of initiative, that kind of perseverance. And so, in his physical condition, you know, he he couldn't do pencil and paper theory. Not that I'm a theorist, and he certainly couldn't go and obtain data at observatories, especially not back when you know astronomers had to go to observatories more. But he could talk to his computer and he could program it in this way so he could analyze data, especially large statistical samples, okay? So he worked on the big sample of supernovae that we had accumulated over nearly two decades of the Lick Observatory Supernova Search with Kate, the Katzman Automatic Imaging Telescope. We had you know, nearly a thousand supernovae or something, or maybe by his time only seven or 800, whatever it was. So, you know, I had to learn how to accommodate his condition and provide opportunities for him to best fulfill his potential. And I was also taught to be more patient than before. You know, patience is something that I probably lack some of, you know, I'm kind of hardworking and want results yesterday, you know, and um, I had to become more patient with him. And I had to realize that to a greater or lesser degree, you know, many people have disabilities, physical or mental, that don't completely cut them off from this type of, of profession, but that won't necessarily at the same time work at my speed or with as few distractions as I typically am privileged to have, you know. And so I need to accommodate them and see that, you know, science is done by good people in, in many different ways, not just in my way, you know? So, and it was very deeply rewarding to be his PhD advisor, you know? So that's, that's one student. Lovely. Thank you, Alex. Mm -hmm. um, what have you learned over all of these years that you wish that new faculty members understood when they began their teaching careers? Yeah. You know, um, well, partly it's the rewards of, of teaching combined with research. It's not one or the other. You know, they really do complement one another. And the other is that, you know, it's a process. We don't have to be perfect or even very good teachers initially. We can all improve and everyone benefits. You know, listen to the advice your students give you regarding your teaching. Read the evaluations carefully. I mean, some of them are completely crazy, or at least I think so. But take note of points that students make repeatedly, even if initially you disagree. If a lot of people are saying it, it might mean that you know, you're missing something and you can, you can improve your teaching by at least taking that perspective into account. 
and put your heart and soul into it. You know, wear your passion on your sleeve. And it can be a highly rewarding experience that will indeed also enhance your research because, you know, if you just sort of show up to your classroom and you look bored and, and students immediately pick up on the, the fact that you're not really very interested in teaching them, you'd rather be somewhere else. Well, then they would rather be somewhere else too. You know, they'll start tuning out and going to one of the multitude of distractions, especially now with Twitter and Facebook and all these things. And especially during the current time when we're teaching remotely and everyone's stuck to their computer screen, right? It's so easy to just go off and, you know, especially if they can turn off their camera and we don't require their cameras to be on. So I don't know what they're doing in one ear, out the other, maybe not even in one ear. If they can tell that you're not interested in reaching out to them and you're not genuinely interested in conveying your excitement for the field to them, or they might even think that you're just sitting around doing this to get a job, you know, you're not even really excited about your field. So why should they be excited? You know, wear your passion for your subject and for teaching on your sleeve. That is the number one thing of good teaching. I mean, obviously you need to know what you're saying, be organized, know what you're gonna talk about, be competent and all that. But you can be pretty good in all those things. The number one key is to be passionate and excited and to convey that passion to your students immediately from minute number one, grab their attention and then maintain it. And you will get good teaching evaluations, even if they don't learn a hundred facts and remember them a year, a month, or even a week later, they will have understood at least part of the process of science. Well, they'll understand a few key concepts, like in my field, we're all made of star stuff, like Carl Sagan used to say, and the universe is expanding and it was born in a big bang. I mean, there are five or 10 things that I tell them I'd like them to gain from this course and to remember sometime later, okay? And I'll go and ask them on their deathbeds. And, um, you know, it's just a, you know, a handful of things. What are and, those things, Alex? And the process of science, how it is and why it is we do science. That's as important, if not more so than, than the facts. I'm sorry, you said something there and I didn't catch it. Yeah, what are those things that you tell them that you hope that they remember at the end of yeah. What can, um, well, what can we learn from that? Right. So, you know, we are made of star stuff. I mean, the atoms in your body, the carbon in your cells, the oxygen that you breathe, the calcium in your bones, the iron in your red blood cells, they were generated by nuclear reactions in stars billions of years ago. Indeed, billions of years even before the solar system formed in many cases. And so we are now made of them. That, that's just one of the greatest discoveries of all time. The idea that the finite speed of light, the fact that it's not infinite, lets us look back in time by looking to progressively greater distances and we can look at the evolution of galaxies. That there's another important concept. The birth of the universe in a big bang and that it's been expanding from just, just almost nothingness, right? Devoid of structure and the structure building up over time culminating with sentient beings that can and are coming to an understanding of how it all fits to, together. That's just such a beautiful concept. The glory of a total solar eclipse, put it on your bucket list. I don't care whether you've seen a 90, 95 or 98% eclipse sun. If it hasn't been 100%, you haven't completely lived. So there's one on April 8th, 2024 coming up. I again tell them that if I find out they didn't go see it and they didn't have a super good reason to not go see it, especially if they were a cut within a couple of hundred miles of the path of totality, which goes through Mexico and Texas and up to New York. If they don't have a good reason, I will retroactively fail them and their careers will be shot. Of course, I'm, that's all tongue in cheek, you know, <laughs> but anyway, you know, there's four of them or, you know, so. It, yeah. seems, it seems like there are a lot of parents on the call today who are hoping 
to get their young people into your classes eventually. Tell us a little bit about, you know, in your opinion, what the best way to get a preteen, for example, interested more in astronomy. Are there some online resources? You know, we're all homeschooling right now. What can sure. we do? To yeah. You know, it's it's been particularly hard with my own kids. I try not to be the overbearing father and stuff, but um, you know, my, one of my regrets is that I haven't gotten my kids more interested in this sort of stuff. And again, maybe it's um, easier for me to just talk about other people's kids, but there's an awful lot of really great online material out there. There are tons of lectures, especially now in the COVID-19 era and lots of, you know, science oriented talks. I mean, there's Brian Greene's World Science Festival. You know, when I run or walk, I listen to the, the, the interviews that Brian Greene and others do. There's the Commonwealth Club that has lots of talks, including talks on science. I gave one about, you know, Lick Observatory in part some time ago, um, and about how I got interested in science and sort of my career. Um, there's just tons of stuff out there. I've given lots of talks, public talks that are on YouTube. So there's really a lot of good online material. And there are a lot of good documentaries now, many more than when I was a kid. You know, there's the universe series and how the universe works. I've contributed a lot to both of those series. And, and maybe they overly sensationalize things. They, they love having lots of fancy graphics with stellar explosions. But again, that's how you get people interested. And I've had a lot of people email me that they were flipping through channels. And you know the seven second rule, if you don't get someone interested in seven seconds, they'll move on to something else. So they're flipping through channels and they saw some explosion graphic. And then they, they watched that show and it got them interested in science. And yeah, you know, maybe we bring it down to a fairly low common denominator, but again, it gets people interested. And those shows often try to have at least some material that's of interest to the person who already knows more. Uh, with kids, get them, get them some hands-on opportunities if possible. And now there are all these maker fairs, right? That are prolifer proliferating. I think one of the biggest in the country is the one that occurs in San Mateo, right? On the peninsula, it's just gigantic. And I think they probably, they couldn't do it. Actually, they did it just, I, I think in early March before COVID-19 hit. But, you know, there are lots of these maker fairs and those are a good way to get your hands dirty and to walk to a bunch of exhibits. When it reopens, go, go to the Exploratorium, a hands-on museum, go to the Chabot Space and Science Center in the Oakland Hills, um, of which I'm a member of the board of directors. Those are good places, you know, that are not just museums, although I'm in favor of museums too, like the Cal Academy and things like that. Um, but those that encourage hands-on, um, interaction with the exhibits can be can be really good as well. Is there a good telescope we should be using from home if we're complete novices and we want to get our kids involved? You well, always tell the story about, you know, discovering. Yeah, you know, by the way, again, going back to Chabot, you know, they have these telescopes that are open on Friday and Saturday evenings for people. And, and Lick has a summer program as well, but those have been put on hold this mm -hmm. summer. But at Chabot on Saturdays, they do through Facebook Live a, um, a video thing where they show you with a detector, you know, what it is they're looking at and they talk about it and stuff. That's what I'm encouraging, you know, my students to do since we can't have real star parties on the roof of Campbell Hall, the, the Berkeley Astronomy Building. So just, you know, Google or whatever your favorite search engine is, Google Chabot Space and Science Center virtual star parties and you know you'll land on the site so that's something people can do even without having their own telescope but gosh there's so many telescopes on the market now there are a lot of good ones and it really depends on how much you want to pay uh, but there i mean my first one was a little 60 millimeter six centimeter 2.4 inch refractor and the third star i looked at what turned out to be saturn and it knocked my socks off you know and this was a shaky little $100, 2.4 inch refractor. And one grand will give you quite a nice telescope, you know, 
um, you know, and several grand will give you really a great one. But for a couple of hundred bucks, you can get a, a pretty good telescope. And look at the moon. The, the moon is just a fabulous sight, all those craters and stuff. And if it's big enough to show the rings of Saturn and the moons of Jupiter, look at those things, because the rings of Saturn will knock your socks off and the moons of Jupiter will show you what Galileo saw 400 years ago, that we're not the only body around which things orbit. And you can look at the phases of the moon, which was the single best piece of evidence in favor of a Copernican heliocentric model rather than you know, Aristotelian, Ptolemaic, um, Earth-centered, geocentric model. You know. Um, we're talking a lot about you know, how to get folks inspired and, and curious in the first place. What are the questions that keep you curious yeah. now? Oh, and by the way, speaking of questions, I, I can go on until about 5.15 or whatever you want to break it off, but um, I hope there will be a Q&A session. So what are the questions you're saying that- What are the you? biggest questions that keep you curious? Oh, that keep me curious. You know, ones that unfortunately probably will not be answered in my lifetime, but it's the quest that's fun, right? Um, it's the journey. So obviously in my own field, you know, what is the dark energy? And what is dark matter? Uh, I'm hoping we'll know what dark matter is. I'm a bit less sanguine that we'll know what dark energy is in my lifetime, because I think it's a really hard problem. And especially if the data keep on suggesting that it's something close to what's called the cosmological constant, which is essentially a vacuum energy associated with space itself. That would be really weird, but really interesting. The trouble is you can't ever prove that it's a vacuum energy, you can only prove that it's not a vacuum energy if at least some of the observables don't agree with the expectations for a vacuum energy. But you can never show that the observed quantities differ from the expected quantities if in fact they are arbitrarily close to what you expect. You never know whether in the 13th decimal place or something you'll, you'll see some sort of thing that that doesn't agree, okay? But if it doesn't agree, then, gosh, then you've proven that it's not, but you can never prove that it is. And I fear that the dark energy is this cosmological constant, which we will never prove. Anyway, um, that's a neat question. The question of, is there life, especially intelligent life in the universe? That's not something I personally work on, but I think it's one of the greatest questions of humanity. Um, you know, that, that's really something that I think is very interesting. Then there are these existential questions that, again, I don't personally work on, but, you know, what about climate change and the other uh, existential threats, really? Um, either deliberate or, I mean, I hope not deliberate, but accidental. You know, unwittingly, we will destroy this, uh, this earth, at least for something as complex and advanced as homo sapiens. You know, more generally, what, what is in store for the future of humanity? And, you know, I, I know we're all going to die, and that's just a fact of life. But to me, one of the hardest parts is that I'll never know what the world is like, certainly in a century, or, um, you know, and, and how much the world could change in a century, or, or even in 50 or 30 years or whatever I've got, you know. Um, What's Earth going to be like in a millennium? What's it going to be like in a million years? Are we going to be replaced by machines, by computers? Um, an enormously interesting question. General artificial intelligence, how far will it get? You know, these are all wonderful questions that uh, keep me up at night. But I don't know that there's much I can do to help answer them. <laughs> but they're certainly very interesting. Another related question from the chat, Bobby asked, how do you connect the relevancy of astrophysics directly um, relative to climate change? Well, you know, um, in studying other planets in our solar system, and now astrophysicists are studying other planets, we come to a better understanding of Earth's climate. So we've watched the development of storms on Uranus and Neptune. My colleague Imke de Potter has done that with the Keck telescopes and using adaptive optics with the Lick three meter telescope as well. 
So of course, you know, Earth is more complex with bodies of water and continents and all that. Still, we can understand more about Earth by more generally understanding these other planets. And although I don't think a runaway greenhouse effect will occur on Earth uh, because there's been asteroid impacts that have vaporized a lot of the carbonates in Earth's crust, making the temporary you know, carbon dioxide content of Earth's atmosphere enormous, that didn't lead to a runaway greenhouse like on Venus. And so I don't think we're in danger of that. Nevertheless, you don't need a runaway greenhouse on Earth to be potentially fatal for, for Homo sapiens, you know. And understanding what happened on Venus certainly gives us insights on what could happen to a lesser extent on Earth. And, you know, you only need 10 degrees or even perhaps fewer for things to become quite uncomfortable here on Earth. You don't need Earth's surface temperature to be in excess of 800 degrees Fahrenheit, like on Venus. But I think the idea of what could happen on Earth was brought to the fore when people like Carl Sagan were studying Venus and the runaway greenhouse there and the potential, for example, for a nuclear winter, if an all out nuclear war were to occur. Again, there's debate as to how far that would go, but certainly it would mess things up temporarily, and it's not clear that we would bounce back, um, at least as a species. Life probably wouldn't perish, just like it didn't completely perish when the giant asteroid or comet collisions occurred. But certainly, there were gigantic changes to life on Earth. Stephen Jay Gould's idea of punctuated equilibrium, you know, evolution sort of rattles along at a slow place and pace, and then wham, something occurs that completely changes the, the dominant species of, of life on Earth, like what happened uh, certainly at the Cambrian explosion. We're not exactly sure what happened then, but the Cretaceous-Paleogene transition 66 million years ago was almost certainly precipitated by a comet or asteroid collision. And um, that was obviously really important. You know, So it's those kinds of studies that can help us with climate change. And then, of course, Going back to what I said earlier, we train people to think carefully and logically and to solve problems. And many go on to fields that are more immediately useful to society, computer science, engineering, medical physics, um, 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 yeah, I mean, there's a, several others. I'm having, having a brain fart right now, but um, medical physics, engineering, computer science, um, Oh, applied physics, things like that, right? Those are fields in which people can address some of the climate change issues, like do we success for car sequester carbon? If so, how? Uh, how do we find new renewable sources of energy, solar energy, things like that? I mean, a great example is Stephen Chu, a Nobel Prize winning physicist from both Berkeley and Stanford, who, you know, is working on various biofuels and stuff like that. But he was trained as a physicist. You know, his, his Nobel Prize was, was not in things that were so immediately useful to society. But by doing astrophysics and learning it, and then moving on into other fields, astronomers can be more helpful to society than just becoming professors of astrophysics like myself. Um, I'm going to keep asking some questions from the chat, but sure. I know that some folks have to leave at, at five. So I wanted to ask you um, one uh, uh, a more official question. Um, you know, on a personal note, Alex, uh, everyone on this call knows that we almost lost Lick Observer last oh, week. Oh, yeah. Um, and that you might have lost the Kate that you've done this work with your student team for all of these years. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that was like? To, to be watching that and, and what it would have meant to have lost the Kate and ultimately Lick Observatory. Yeah, you know, that night, the main night of August 19th to 20th, I was up all night watching the webcams, which miraculously were still operating at Lick. And I guess even though we lost the PG&E power lines, we still had power up there from our own generators. But anyway, I was watching the webcams with great trepidation 
and fear and just anxiety. It was a long night. And there was one webcam that looks toward the three meter dome and Kate behind it and Kepler Peak, which is where Kate is located. Oh, and you can see in that webcam, the automated planet finder as well, which is really an important telescope. And there were a few times when flames were getting kind of pretty close to the APF, but they were squelched and that was good. But my main focus was on Kepler Peak, behind which it's quite obvious there was a gigantic hotspot. The fire had moved around the observatory to the backside, so to speak. And there were all these flashes of, of light, I guess, flames reflecting off of the smoke. And there were times when Kate was enveloped in the smoke and the smoke was lit up by flames, but I did not know whether the flames had overtaken the summit of Kepler Peak and Kate or whether this was just a cloud of smoke that had encompassed the surroundings and off of which light was, surround, was uh, reflecting. So, I'd wait typically four minutes, depending on the time of the night, it seems, but the new update would come in and sometimes the peak was still enveloped in smoke. And so I still didn't know what was going on. And at other times it had moved away and I could see that the dome was still there. So then I'd breathe a temporary sigh of relief. But yeah, I mean, kudos to the Cal Fire and other fire firefighters. I know Costas Chloris, our mountain superintendent, had a major role in what was going on. The firefighters, I think, and I kind of guessed this after a while because, you know, I could see that there was no clear progress toward the Kepler Peak, but I figured that the firefighters were on Mount Hamilton Road just behind the peak and really pouring it on in terms of the water and whatever their other efforts were. And I think it's in part because Kate was there and also in part because there are some houses for some of the employees on the road leading to Kepler Peak. And so that became a real focal point for their, uh, for their efforts in saving Lake Observatory. So I'm very, very grateful and they are heroes and we should do something when things have stabilized a little bit, throw a big party for them. You know, I'm enormously grateful. Uh, what it would have meant was obviously the, the lack of access to the students who are participating in things like the Lick Observatory Supernova Search and in our long-term monitoring of supernovae. Again, this is a way that our students get their hands dirty with research. More generally, of course, if more of the observatory had burned, other telescopes would have burned down. And the other research that we do, like our spectroscopic monitoring of exploding stars, the automated planet finder and all the great work that it's doing in searching for exoplanets, especially Earth-like exoplanets, in the habitable zone. And then of course, our very important um, technological development effort like laser guide star adaptive optics. We do a lot of that at Lick. And then once things are uh, perfected, we can move them over to the Keck telescopes, which are much more expensive to run each night. And then finally, our public education and outreach effort, which is an enormously important part of what we do at Lick Observatory. You know, without the 36 inch refractor and the main building where tours are held and there are a lot of exhibits that people can look at, without that main building, you know, our public outreach and education effort would be uh, lost at least temporarily, if not forever, because how do you rebuild the historic main building, you know? Um, so it would have been pretty calamitous for the four pillars of what I think Lick does. The excellent research, especially on projects that require long-term repetitive access to telescopes, the technology development, the student and postdoctoral training and access, and then the public education and outreach. In those four areas, we have one of the greatest, if not the single greatest combination of any observatory in the world, I would say right now. It's that combination. You know, we may not be number one in any of the four. We don't have the biggest telescopes, but again, in part because we don't have the biggest telescopes, we have lots of access to smaller telescopes with cutting edge instruments and stuff. And then all those other things we do. So it would have been a tremendous loss. Thank you, Alex. Um, 
some fun questions, uh, I think personally. Um, do you ever just go outside with a telescope and enjoy the night sky? Yeah, I do. I mean, I got into astronomy very much through the amateur astronomy perspective. From age 10 through 17, my main interest scientifically was chemistry. I was going to become a professor of chemistry somewhere. Okay, there was no doubt about it, you know. But in high school, as a freshman, my parents gave me a small telescope, this 2.4 inch refractor. And the third star I looked at was not a star, it was a planet. And then I, you know, started having this greater interest, this, this growing slope in astronomy that eventually passed up chemistry sometime near the end of my freshman year in college. And that's when I switched from chemistry to physics with the intention of doing astrophysics. And I still like chemistry, but really I've never looked back. So I know the constellations better than most professional astronomers, I would say, especially in the Northern hemisphere. I know how to find my way around, you know, with a 2.4 inch refractor, you have to, to hop from, from star to star in, in order to find the ring nebula in Lyra or the Hercules globular cluster. Now there are all these go-to devices that take you there. Part of the fun is gone. You know, <laughs> um, and for the longest time, I only had the 2.4 inch refractor. Um, and for many, year, many years, I didn't use it, but I would go by invitation and sometimes just on my own to various amateur astronomy star parties. I would be asked by amateur astronomy groups to speak and then I would stay for their star party. But a few years ago, I bought a Celestron telescope and that's been fun to look through and I try to show things to my kids. And then more recently, as part of my education and outreach effort, I bought one of these unistellar EV scopes. And I own no stock in them or anything like that. But um, if any of you are interested, write to me, alex at astro.berkeley.edu. And because I know um, some of the people that started that company, one of them was a postdoctoral scholar at Berkeley some years ago, I can get you a special deal and, and put get you to be higher up in the queue uh, because these things are on order, but, but write to me and it's called an EV scope. It's not cheap, but it's amazing what it can do, okay? And you can take real professional quality images and contribute to citizen science in a meaningful way. And uh, being part of the EV scope slash Unistellar partnership, they have all kinds of projects that they have people doing. And so it's really fun. And you can share your images with other people in real time, like using your phone. So, um, so I still like looking through telescopes and it's been a while since I've been to an amateur astronomy star party, but as part of Wonderfest, the Bay Area Festival of Science, I'm on the board of directors there and that's run by Tucker Hyatt. He has lots of um, various um, astronomy talks and they are partners in now the Mount Tamil Pius uh, series of lectures, which they put on with the San Francisco amateur astronomers and other groups. But I've spoken at the Mount Tam series probably seven or eight times over the years and at the Lick series and many other such series. And then I, I often stay on afterwards to look through the, the telescopes at Mount Tam or the ones at Lick. I still get a thrill looking through the great Lick refractor and I'll go outside and we have a, a, a great cadre of amateur astronomers who have their telescopes set up and they'll be pointing to a bunch of different things. Um, and since only a small minority of the people go out to the back there and look through those telescopes and there are more telescopes there, you can look at more things. And I still get a thrill, a childlike thrill at looking at Saturn and other things. So yeah, I highly recommend it. Um Many of us uh, won't have the opportunity to take your classes, obviously, um, and our self-teaching. Um, are there any particular books that you would recommend that, that would tell us about the cutting edge of astronomy now? Oh, yeah. You know, and this, I, I realize I forgot to say when you were saying what else is out there for kids. There, there are lots and lots of books now, more so than there were before. Um, I mean, there are a lot of great author, authors. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Lisa Randall, Sean Carroll, Brian Greene, Max Tegmark. There's all kinds of authors out there who have written good popular books. Jan Eleven, um, who talked about the, the gravitational wave detections. It's called Black Hole Blues and 
other symphonies from outer space or something like that. Anyway, there are tons of books out there. Um, you know, I have an introductory college level astronomy book suitable for high school students as well, uh, richly illustrated. There's also video courses. You know, you said you can't take my course at Berkeley and that's true because, because of intellectual property and other issues, we're, not, we're no longer allowed to post all our lectures online. That's, that's the reason folks, there, there are issues having to do with that. But um, I've given courses to this company called The Great Courses and you can look those up. And when you get them on sale, the cor the, I mean, the company nearly gives them away. It's like a dollar a lecture or something ridiculous like that. Uh, so there are a lot of good lectures out there. Um, uh, books on the sky, yeah, there's, I mean, there, there are classic ones by, oh, it's a fellow named Ray, R-E-Y, I think. I forgot the first name, but there, there are these classics out there. I mean, you know, the constellations haven't changed. There are lots of good ones out. Patrick Moore, I think, had some good ones. I'm just not remembering them right now, but you know, use an online search engine, popular books for, for kids or learning about the sky. Um, actually, one of my courses for the great courses was called Sky Watching, Seeing and Understanding Cosmic Wonders. And so it's about various things in the daytime and nighttime sky and their physical explanation. Auroras, the green flash, rainbows, lunar and solar halos, the colors of the sky. By the way, wasn't it wild a couple of Wednesdays ago when during the day the sky was orange, okay? That's the first time I had seen that color for the whole sky, not looking directly at the sun. So yeah, there's lots of stuff out there, but um, I'm just not remember remembering um, a lot of the specific things, except for this Ray thing, R-E-Y, I think is how it was spelled. Yeah. We'll, we'll ask you to, to put them down in writing and we'll- Sure, yeah, I'll be glad to do that, yeah. Well, I just wanted to take time um, to thank you again, Alex. Your passion for astronomy, for astrophysics is, is so absolutely clear to all of us. And we're so lucky that you're sharing um, that passion with students. After all, this is University of California Observatories, right? Well, for, um, for and it's whom the university. Is the university. Yeah, yeah. For whom is the university if not for the students and the public, especially mm -hmm. given that the University of California is a public institution? Yeah. Absolutely. You know? um, so I'm just so grateful that you're willing to take this time to talk to us about your teaching today. And I know it's a, it's a little bit off of, of, of your usual lecture. So really yeah. appreciate that time, Alex. And, and well, really you know, th thank you for the privilege and the opportunity of doing this. And I think I want to, you know, commend Marianne and Natasha for coming up with this idea. You know, originally I was going to give yet another talk about my research, but you can find quite a few of those online. And I gave one earlier in the summer and I gave one for the Keck Observatory as well, which um, I believe if you become a donor of the Keck Observatory, uh, they have those online as well. And, you know, University of California observatories include Keck, Lick, the University of California shops, as they're called, the labs where a lot of the detectors are built and the spectrographs and imaging devices are built. And of course, our whole UC system, student and public outreach effort. That's part of the UC observatories as well. So we, we thank you, the general public, for your ongoing support and interest, and we hope we can maintain it. And we're all too happy to have these opportunities to give back to you, the taxpayer and the donor, um, in part to show our gratitude for, for what you've done for us. So thank you. Thank you. A few last announcements. Um, as we head into the fall, instead of weekly events, we'll be doing um, monthly events as our faculty members go back into the classroom so that they have time to focus on their teaching. Um, our next event in October, uh, we will send out an email um, uh, reminding you all this information, of course, will be October 20. Um, and I'm excited to introduce you all to the director of our lab for adaptive optics, Phil Hunt. He will be talking um, with us all and he just started about a year ago. So really excited to introduce you to him and let him talk to you about um, any updates that he might be able to provide on the adaptive optics at Lick Observatory and their condition, um, if we know that by then, and also what our plans for the future are there. Um, in addition, uh, we've been asked uh, to talk to our supporters and discourage any travel up 
to Lick Observatory right now. Um, Caltrans is a, in particular is in the process of clearing the roads and, and making things safe. Um, we have a lot of work ahead to prepare for mudslide season um, now that the fires have gone through. So really appreciate you spreading the word that um, let's let those folks do the good work that's going to continue to keep the observatory safe. I know we're all really curious um, to see what it looks like and, and what all was impacted, but, but really appreciate um, that patience with us all. Thank you all again for joining us um, for another fantastic um, conversation with one of our astronomers. Really appreciate that I'm seeing so many familiar faces and that you keep coming back um, to hear more. Um, please feel free to reach out to either Mary Ann or I if you have any suggestions or ideas. Um, otherwise, we'll see you next month. Thank you, everyone. And I put my email address into the chat box, alex at astro.berkeley.edu.